All right, everybody, it's Thomas again. We're here for the KAAMP, that is the Knoxville Area Artist Networking Platform. And today we have a really cool guest. Uh, would you please introduce yourself? Um, I'm Denise Stewart Sanabria. And uh, how do you get down in the creative world? How do I get down? Well, how do you get down? It's the only thing that I've ever existed in, is the creative world. <laughs> I guess you could say that. So I've been doing what I've been doing since I was three years old. So, what what were you doing at three? That's a really like that's a really sharp line and really early. Most people can't say that. Okay, yeah, my first memory is of stealing scissors. So that <laughs> yeah. So one of the things, one of the businesses my father had on the side when I was really really little was selling greeting cards through his cards. through his store, where um, C A. I'm sorry, Mass. I'm. I'm from Massachusetts, and we don't recognize certain letters. <laughs> but anyways, um, I would, he would have the old sample books that would be discarded, and I could get them, and I would do collages by cutting stuff up with all of these greeting cards that I would yank out of the sample books. And that was at three years old? Yeah. And they let you have the scissors? Yeah. Or oh, you yeah. stole them? This was in the 60s. We could have knives, scissors, <laughs> you know, we could do anything. Shovels, tool, power tools. I, my father let me play with a table saw when I, you know, well, not play with it, but I, <laughs> I was helping him, you know, with the tip, push wood through the table saw when I was eight, nine, ten years old. All right. Yeah. So you were exposed to a lot of different uh, materials and and resources when you were young. Two man saws to cut down trees with my mother. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what uh, What was the house like growing up? Was it full of music and art and all the things, or was it a little uh, a little more sparse? I come from a large Bohemian family, so my the house was full of original art, and um, I had various uncles that were symphonic performers soloists and one aunt that was an opera singer my mother played the piano everyone played the piano as yeah so two circus performers also. oh man yeah. two great uncles one was a strong man and the other one was a trick horseback rider you had the bases covered in that yeah house. yeah that's amazing yeah. so we're sitting in your studio now uh, can we sort of guide this conversation from this geographic space out towards places your art has drifted in the world geographically? So here, can you, can you help our listeners uh, paint the picture of your studio in their heads? Okay, uh, right now I've got a couple of really big paintings. Well, not really. F fairly large paintings. Way bigger than I was. Yeah, well, <laughs> they're commissions and I've got five galleries. Um, in four different states, and one of them is going to end up to a client in Charleston through my gallery, Mitchell Hill, and the other one's local, and my local gallery is Bennett Galleries. And um, I've got other stuff backed up where I'm in the pro. You know, when you have multiple galleries, it's like bigamy, and so just keeping inventory in them you keep thinking I have really neglected Maryland for too long I cannot remember the last time I visited Maryland they're going to divorce me unless I give them <laughs> some more stuff you know and so I'm trying to get to my regular work to give inventory to my galleries and meanwhile I've been stuck on both corporate and personal commissions I, I do almost all my commissions through my galleries because it's a collaboration, it's a partnership. To keep the galleries in business, you don't sneak around behind them. I might be a bigamist and have, you know, five different galleries, but I don't sneak around, I, you know, I don't have anyone on the side. Well, there are. <laughs> that's, that's the appropriate channel, right? <laughs> gotta, go through, gotta go through them. I know a lot of artists that will take commissions behind their galleries back in the same geographic lo location where they have contracts. And that's shady. It's very shady and the galleries always end up dropping them. And they have a bad, they forever are tarnished, those artists, they get a bad name. 
And then without the visibility of being in the gallery and the reputation you get for that and the legitimization, they lose all that too. They, they lose contact yeah. to those, you know, it eventually erodes their career. That makes sense. You got to keep the good relationships going. And I love my galleries. I've never, ever dealt with a gallery that I did not absolutely love and really enjoy working with everyone who was running it. It's like you're able to have such fruitful relationships. Is it's, that is that because you're picky? Yes. I spy on them. So <laughs> some, some gallery will, will, well, the way it usually works is a gallery goes out of business. So it's like, shit, I want one in the same location, you know. So I, I lost one when he went under in Charleston. And so... This other gallery, Mitchell Hill, got right to me and said, um, we know he's getting rid of, you know, we know he's closing. Would you like to be represented by us? So the first thing I did is I picked several artists that were already doing business mm -hmm. with them off of the website, and I emailed them. <laughs> and I said, do you like them? Do they pay you on time? Are they nice to work right. with? And that's when I go with them. Okay, so you get feedback first. Yeah, and... I got I, I was asked by this another Massachusetts gallery um, two months ago, would you like us to represent you? And I went behind their back and I heard things like, they will not communicate with you, it's obnoxious, they will pay you, <laughs> but doing business with them and communicating, they will go two months without answering your email. Oh, that's a shame. And so I didn't want them anyway, so because <laughs> I don't want a sixth gallery. You dodged that bullet. But I know how they found me. Um, one of my galleries was one of the downtown, most prominent downtown, Provincetown, Massachusetts galleries, which is a total art mecca and has been for decades, well, for about 100 years. But um, the owner got into a car wreck where someone ran into her at 80 miles an hour. And so both her and her wife were so seriously injured, they can no longer physically run the gallery. They yeah. were told, you know, for a couple of years, you are not picking up anything heavier than 10 pounds. Yeah. And so they actually sold it last August. So I just had a solo show with them, and the remaining paintings are still here because it's only online uh, I see. so they're trying to see if they can run an online gallery so when something sells i create it i create it here and i ship yeah. it out and i don't know how it's going to work out because if they can't move my work i'm not going to stay right with them which really sucks because i've known her since i was three years old <laughs> also partnering crime huh also partnering crime Oh, God, yeah, yeah. I mean, she knows where all the bodies are buried and everything. Yeah, we've been, pl we, I played with her in the woods and stuff since, since it, I, I, she's actually two years younger than me. It was her older brother that I hung out with, yeah. and she followed us. Well, that's, that's usually yeah, how little, it goes. Little sister followed us. Yeah. And had, <laughs> I have a little sister. I know how it is. Yeah, yeah. But um, she's the only gallery owner I've been with where I, I, I had a past with a person. I actually yeah. personally knew them, which which is fun. And so when she asked me, she was gallery number five. I couldn't say no. I right. kept thinking, no, no, no. I don't. This is going to kill <laughs> me. I don't have. I. I'm already working seven days a week, but. I said yes. <laughs> and that was number five. Uh huh. Yeah. So. So I think that this other gallery in Massachusetts, they wanted to buy her yeah. location and she kept telling them no and so they've been in and out of our galleries so yeah and the coolest thing with exhibiting there was one of her other artists um last year she does it once in a while was kurt vonnegut's daughter hmm. yeah so i got to have a like a two-person show with kurt vonnegut's daughter well, last that's cool year. yeah yeah, yeah really I mean, cool. for everyone who has read Slaughterhouse Five, yeah, baby, you know. <laughs> that's cool. uh, so, for those that can't see, which is everybody listening on earphones right now, can you tell us what the pieces in progress look like right now, the style and uh, and mediums? Okay, I work on I work with oil, and um, I do 
these culinary dramas, they're anthropomorphic food paintings where I take backgrounds that I source from multiple centuries of fabric and wallpaper that make cultural commentary in some bizarre way. And I add in tchotchkes, you know, all kinds of like weird ceramic animals and things like that and strange dishes. Um, dinosaurs, yes, I, 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 uh, ceramic dinosaurs, they sell. I, I mean, yeah, dinosaurs. Yeah, <laughs> um, Puking kitty gravy, gravy boats, anything that I find really amusing. Old, weird, strange figurines that look like they come from Versailles. Anything that looks like it comes from Versailles, from that period of <laughs> yeah. European, that's mine, you know. And then I throw in a bunch of food, whether it's cakes, fruits, or vegetables, uh, semi-mutilated, highly decorative. I want everything to look like it's been through some kind of an, an event, whether it was a drunken patty or possibly occasional a natural disaster. Just drama. It's staged dramas. And they have to culturally work with each other and I've got one that's got a tropical background going on now that's going to have this cake I made that I think they're called volcano cakes or or I forgot but you make like three or four layers of cake and you scoop out the middle and you throw a bunch of candy in it and then when you cut a piece out all of this candy comes spilling out <laughs> I like, like that. for you hunters, it's like after you've gutted the bird or the deer. Right. <laughs> for other Very people, um, gee, I don't know. It just comes spilling out. And I, the one I got, it, I filled it up with like those malted Easter ball, Easter egg things and stuff like that. And the other painting is, um, it's got a blue-black background. It's highly dramatic and it has these... I use a lot of ceramic rabbits because they're fertility symbols. Not so much... I like bunnies, but they're fertility symbols and there's oftentimes semi-naughty things going on. But this one, it, it's a totemic. It looks like a totem from some kind of Paleolithic tribe or something, but much better, much well a lot more sophisticated. It does have a nice bouquet of flowers coming out of the top of its head. It's a vase. Those oh. are the ears. There's holes, so ah, you stick. You get. Excellent. Yeah, it's a vase. Excellent. So I like to, I like to jab flowers and things. You know, imp <laughs> impale, impale food with flowers. I like that you're using really violent adjectives because this is a very dramatic painting, right? Well, yeah. You said molested, yeah, yeah. molested food, and you know, you yeah, jab and flowers into things. There's a semi bedraggled. Um, lemon meringue pie that has flamingo drink stirrers stabbed into it <laughs> where they've got this they're really nice looking that it's cheap plastic stuff but it, they've got these clear tubes with the flamingos on top and you can there's for stirring drinks but they're good for stabbing into stuff and then a bunch of just exhausted donuts um, it's, I, I listen, I don't know, maybe it's what I listen to. I listen to audiobooks that yeah. I download from the library the whole time I'm working. And it's always going to end up with something like Michael Crichton or David Baldacci, where there's some kind of violent things going on. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I don't have female, oh, God forbid. I hate that. The stereotype of female taste in literature. Oh. Ah, the gender associations with what you're supposed to like right is so painful <laughs> i mean males are terribly enslaved by that worse than women it's okay for women to like guy stuff but if guys uh, it, like female stuff they get into way more trouble yeah it's it, it doesn't flow the same in both like, directions yeah yeah it does not flow in the same directions even now even now you end up getting your ass kicked but um, I grew up, I, I was never treated as a girl. I was never, I was just, there were two of us, my brother and me, 
we were the kids. Yeah. And we were, <laughs> yeah. and it, it's Massachusetts. You find very few parents who bring their daughters up girly, especially out in the country where I was. You know, they hand you a pitchfork or a shovel. Yeah. And say, go clean that shit up. <laughs> you know, and you know, my friends had horses and chickens and cows and I mean the what, what what I used to listen to waking up in the morning was you know it depended upon whether the neighbor's cows got stuck in our wood, woods or not and it, <laughs> I know but, what that's like <laughs> yeah and so my friends drove tractors I drove I regularly stole my mother's tractor she hated it <laughs> but I wasn't allowed to use the tractor but I used to steal it all the time as, as one should if you're trying to get into some shenanigans, you've got to steal a tractor yeah. every now and again. So anyways, there's always <laughs> these concept of gender associations. And when I first started working as an artist, I went towards this large and heroic thing where I did life, I still do them, life-size drawings on charcoal of people. And I cut them out with a jigsaw and I mount them on stands. And they're life-size and you're standing in a room in a gallery space surrounded by these people. And so I'm thinking, you know, it was kind of a male, you know, screw any man that thinks that I can't do what you can do. Yeah. You know, but I was, I'm 65. So I grew up on the other side. I grew up when things were completely closed off just about for women for when I was really little and to all of a sudden, boom, you know, centuries and millennia of female oppression was no longer put up with anymore and the world opened up and it was really great. So does that... So I'm aware of these things, though. I have never really personally experienced being treated as lesser because I'm female. And also because most of the guys I've ever known are great. But I, I've never had to deal with jerks. But because of my mother, I was constantly aware of how she grew up and how she was treated and how she was treated as a wife. I was treated as a kid. She was treated as with a lot of misogyny. That, as my was father. per period, I suppose. Yeah, she was just, you know, oh, you know, oh, Jan, you don't want to do that. You're going to get in trouble. I'm not going to let you know how much money we have in the bank. You're just going to go run out and spend it all. She was nothing like that. She was a, you know, skin flint. She <laughs> and I mean, what, what word is that? I've never heard that word. Skin flint? Oh, yeah. oh she was cheap. Oh. Yeah, I never heard she, she that She was word. thrifty. She was thrifty, yeah. So anyways... Um, for any younger females that don't have the historical perspective I have, we kick the shit out of a lot of stuff to make it so that you don't have to worry about that. I mean, when you go to the Emporium Center yeah. for, for, have you ever, you know what a weenie count is? I would imagine it's how many men are in a room. No, okay. <laughs> if, if that's okay. an assumption. <laughs> and I think it was the late 1980s or the 90s, there was this group called the Gorilla Girls. And they came out of New York, and they were doing the inventory on what percentage of art in a museum in the permanent collection was made by a women by, versus men, how many females got solo shows versus men, and the discrepancy was wow. horrible. Yeah, I'm sure it was very It was <laughs> horrible. And so they did what they called the weenie count. When they would go in a gallery, they would count how many men were represented by that gallery and how many females were. And um, it was really bad. But my, in my experience, every gallery I've been with has had an extremely even ratio. Oh, how fortunate. Yeah, and so when you go to the Emporium Center, whenever they have a juried show, which they're going to in June, and I juried it. Hey. I'm the ju it's the Dogwood Regional, and I jury the show. And so blind jurying, you don't necessarily know who the artists are. Speaking of which, uh, what we didn't do is 
tell your socials. So if you want to get to your socials right now, I'm sorry to interrupt this train of thought, but tell people your social media so they can, oh, they yeah. can find you. Oh, yeah. My website is Stuart, S T E W A R T, dash Sanabria, S A N A B R I A dot com. And if you Google my full name, Denise Stewart Sanabria, you'll find the Instagram, you know, which is linked to my website anyways, my Facebook page. And I show up a lot. <laughs> you have to keep scrolling and scrolling. Yeah, I'm, I'm relentless with what I do. And it, it, it it shows. It shows, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but any, anyways, um, when you look at these juried shows where they're mostly blind jurying, whether it's New American Paintings magazine where every publication is juried, and you count, actually there's more females that will show up when anything is done on the basis of pure merit versus um, association. So it's balanced out, and it's all good, you know, and I'm sure there's shit that still goes on. But um, from a female perspective, in such a, you know, just a rate of just a couple of generations. That's fast. The patriarchy died. Pretty much. I mean, you still see remnants of it, like, I'm in an exhibit right now at the Knoxville Museum of Art, and it's women from the KMA's permanent collection. And the Hunter Museum from Chattanooga has a concurrent exhibit, women in the permanent collection from the Hunter Museum. And it's kind of cringy to be in an all-female exhibit, in a way, because, you, you know, I'd rather just be in an exhibit with, without the added conjecture about it? Without the, you know, it's like, oh, we need extra help. Uh-uh, we don't need any extra help anymore, really. And, you know, this this thing will, it'll continue to go on for maybe another generation until there's no point to it. I want there to be no point to having an all-female exhibit because it's all been equalized. Well, that... Anyway, the art is the point, right? Like that's that's well, the, the art. Part. Well, the art is the point, yeah. But also, um, with gender, you know, with no gender discrimination, why would you ever need one in the future? Right. That's what I want. That's all I. That's all I care about. You know. Fair enough. So, uh, yeah. But when you look at, I was in another show last year w with new acquisitions. And I did the weenie count on the new acquisitions, and it was three female and over 20 men. <laughs> and the curator in the museum didn't really do that. What it is, it's a residual thing that's the tail end of the 20th century happening because almost everything was donated. So they were works donated by families where somebody had died or they were trying to get rid of some of their their um, collections away. And so that was the work that people were collecting in the 20th century, which was primarily male. So what you're seeing is just the dying off of the last thing. Because first I thought, only three of us? Until I read the fine print. And find, you know, to get into right. a museum collection, you have to go through the collection committee, and it's all voted on. And sometimes artists will donate. Um, other people donate stuff they own. Yeah. And sometimes an outside group will get together to fund a piece to be bought into the museum's collection from an artist that they want, you know, because uh, money for new acquisitions is not... What it used to be years ago, and it has nothing to do with the amount of money a museum has, it has to do with how much, what the auction houses did and how they spiked the prices of contemporary art and starting in the 1980s when people like Eric Fischel 
in 1980, his work was going for about $5,000 to $8,000. And a year and a half later, it was selling at auction for over $100,000. And then it went up to a quarter of a million within three years due to auction houses. Inflating the prices. Inflate. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's when Wall Street people started saying, you know, we need to get some kind of a collectible besides stocks. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I know. Let's see, all the classical art, that's pretty much taken up. So let's do contemporary art. You know, who's new, you know? Yeah. Who's new in New York? And then money just thrown at it. Yeah, a lot of these people that buy through auctions, they never even take it out of the crate. And that, it goes into a warehouse. Blows my mind. <laughs> and then they try to flip. Oh, we got this Damien Hurst for only a, a million and a half. Let's see. Uh, mm -mm, let's wait. Three years later, they sell it for four million. You know. Right. But you know, yeah, it, it's the largest art is the largest unregulated industry in the world. I'm not gonna fuss about that too much. No, I don't. I I kind of like it. <laughs> yeah, it. I like wild, it. Wild West ish. Yeah, I don't mind. A lot mind. of room for negotiation. <laughs> I don't mind. So, anyways, this is a my studio is a, it's a basement. I I have intimate relationships with my fan base, which is out back, which is an assortment of squirrels and chipmunks, and they run back and forth, and sometimes they sit and. I swear to God, they watch me. And there's the a chipmunk. There's a chipmunk. There's one particular chipmunk that will sit there, <laughs> and it seems to be watching me. I don't. I might be wrong. You must have good taste. I leave seed out. Oh. Uh. Yeah. So, that's my suspicion. <laughs> but when you're an artist, and I mean I do this for a living, you. I I work god awful hours, and um, you work in isolation. So Often. just having a couple of chipmunks and squirrels running, you know, it's great distraction. I, <laughs> I really appreciate, I appreciate them. Well, you also have a good bit of natural light in your basement, which some people don't have, and that's nice. Well, yeah, I got, it's ground level, so I've got French doors, a window, and... I have very little natural light in my basement, so I'm a little jealous. Oh, <laughs> okay. I've got the right fluorescent mix bulbs, and then I've got spots, various Excellent. spots that are generally used for photography, but they're they're good. You can balance the color. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The panels. Yeah, it's always good. You can get these things and look for ones where you can. They have two knobs to balance the brightness and to balance the color from yet from warm to cold. And that's the type of light. And and you don't have to spend a lot of money for them if you buy them. I shouldn't say don't go to the art supply store to buy. <laughs> because those... There's one. See that? Yeah. That thing sucks. It gives out <laughs> hardly any light. It was like $80 or something. And it illuminates maybe two by two foot square. And... That thing is like a, sh you know, like a construction work. So, <laughs> you know, it illuminates like eight by eight feet. It's a huge difference. So you found a better source for lights. Yeah, I get them. I got them from B and H Photo okay. Supply. That makes sense. Which is that big supplier out in New York that has virtually everything. If so, it works, it works. Yeah, yeah. So stylistically, you you work in what realm? Oh. Um, I'd be considered a hyper-realist. Now, is that your main wheelhouse, or is that just a yeah. part? I, I've done a lot of conceptual work and weird stuff over the years, but um, fooling around and doing you know, stuff that's extra fun, I don't have time for it anymore. I just have time for work. I just, I don't have leisure time, leisure art time. Yeah. I don't have that anymore. It's just deadlines and inventory. And I, I'm not going to complain about that because I don't have to go work at Lowe's yet. Right. As long as the work sells, I'm not in the paint department at Lowe's or Home Depot. <laughs> and that's, that's good. Is that where you see yourself if you weren't doing this at the paint department? 
um, much better than the plumbing department. It would yes. make a lot more sense. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I won't even mind. I steal their paint. You know, see that? <laughs> I do kind of, In fact, I know I a lot of professors tell their students to pick up the paint the paint color chips out of the paint departments and they have them do um, they have them do assignments connected with them but I collect them because I change the colors so much in my work and to be able to pre-conceptualize them having a collection of endless free paint strip you know paint yeah. sample sheets that, that I've taken out of all of these places it, it's an amazing help <laughs> you don't imagine. have to mix the paint up. You say, okay, I've got all these swatches. This, all five of these. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. You know. <laughs> or something will look dull and I'll amp it up and then I'll go by the by the paint strips instead. And, it, you know, uh, color theory is important. It's a massive psychological uh, key. Yeah. And you have a lot of contrast in your pieces, too. Like, you have bright warm colors against a very dark black and blue background here on this one you've got gradients of blue and green and teal and then yeah. everything on top of that is pink and orange and warm colors for the most part. Yeah, th this is like candy because it has several things going on in it that immediately makes specific people go freak out. One is mid-century turquoise and then the other thing is pink flamingos. Flamingos get people oh, for yeah. some reason. Yeah, yeah. And um, in the foreground, which isn't painted yet, there's some... That's the cake, right? Yeah, there's a lot of teal. Teal and turquoise, they're, they're both... Um, they, they both psychologically click in a person's brain. And it's a strange thing if you've ever... Graphic design students understand this. They usually have some book. And the book will... There's several of them out there, and they cover the entire 20th century, and they go by decades. The specific key colors in a decade, the fonts they use, different types of design compositions, and they go decade by decade. And I don't know what it is, but mid-century, 20th century... The architecture, the design, everything was so positive. It was minimalistic to a way, and it was psychologically positive. Even the music. People will go back to it for just doses of psychological positivity in their mind, as opposed to the 1990s with grunge. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you could say, Serious I, well, contrast. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and um, you can psychologically trigger people. Different people are different ages. But the thing about mid-20th century, it doesn't matter what age the person is. They all gravitate towards that. That's so popular in you know pop culture otherwise. I think it's hard to avoid that imagery and, and set of ideas in art. Because yeah. you can turn on the TV or listen to the radio and hear something directly inspired by or homage to a lot. Yeah, it was... Uh... It was a time of significant, well, it, it wasn't so much it was a time of significant change because things had been amping up crazy since the 20s, but it was after the war, so the shit was already passed, you know? Yeah. Death was left behind. So is that aspect of the images you create something you think about from the very beginning? of a process, or is that something you just find along the way? No, it just shows up. Okay. I don't I do not do anything from a deliberate, manipulative, tricky, sneaky, preconceived way. I just, I mix certain things, and they tell me what, you know, all of these different props and things I have, and they basically tell me what they want me to do with them. Okay. So they, they are often the leader, and... Uh, so. My other go-to thing is Versailles. It was the time of obsessions, of materialism that was so over the top. It was extreme. Appetites. Yeah. It didn't end well. Right. 
<laughs> As exaggerations in laughing culture you usually don't. No, it did not end well, but um, it's a fantasy. One and that's somewhat accessible still, too. Yeah, yeah, it's accessible. Oh, we can, I do it cheaply. You know? <laughs> I do a lot of like moon pies. I stick, I'll stick a lot of Versailles esque things, but they'll be filled with zingers, moon pies, snack cakes, and stuff <laughs> like that. And it, it works. I love it. It works. Moon pies are delicious. <laughs> it's a democratic American version of, uh, of grocery store Versailles. Mm. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, would you say there's a ratio of ideas you create versus ideas that come to you? Or is that lopsided in one direction or is it pretty even? Um, it's a it's a process of working. I, I preconceive things randomly for strange reasons that just come to me and the other stuff is fiddled with. Yeah. You know, like uh, I'll go somewhere and somebody, the weirdest thing is I never painted flowers at one point and a friend of mine went into the Beard and Antique Mart and the guy who was working the desk said, I've got all these flowers here, want to take some? <laughs> and they were half dead. But nobody ever gave me flowers before in my entire life, so I was really excited. <laughs> and so then they gave you hack dead flowers. I grabbed them, and then I went to Fresh Market, and I got a really cool-looking cake. Mm -hmm. And I came back, and I just worked with that, you know, with these multiple things. And I came up with this really cool idea, past freshness. I think I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And so that that painting lives, I think, outside of Cleveland, Ohio now. Okay. Yeah. So can you track down any of your other paintings? Are they, oh. Any in private collections all over the United States, right? That's exactly where they are in private collections all over the United States. And most of the time, I don't know who buys them. Sometimes I'll have the buyer send me an image of my work installed in their house on Instagram, and I'll <laughs> say, holy shit, thank you. You know, because that is that that is so cool. I love I love it when that happens. So that's, that's a message from the universe out there. You didn't know where it went, but it found you again. And, yeah. And there it is. Yeah, yeah. And you never want to ask your gallery who bought that because they're thinking, oh, you're going to sneak out and try to contact this person. Direct. Right. So I, I never ask. I, they'll occasionally tell me, but I never ask who's ever bought anything. I don't know if that mystery would sit well with me. <laughs> oh, I mean, I understand, but I don't know if I can handle it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and since I've been on Instagram, I find, I know who buys a lot more of them because they'll contact me right. about has where's that going, you know, and I'll say it's going it's going there and they'll say oh i'm going to get in touch with the gallery now and i'll say oh thanks <laughs> and mo and most about 50 percent of the time they actually do and then and then on down the line the transfer happens yeah and so then i i know who they are right and, yeah but they reach out to you first sometimes that's got to be nice yeah yeah instagram is amazing i do enjoy it for the most part yeah yeah so what what pushes you for hyper realism is that is it just the most enjoyable thing for you? Um, okay, when I when I started college, it was the mid nineteen seventies, or as I prefer to say, the dawn of the age of disco, and so my professors were mostly really young, and so they had just gotten out of college recently. And so they were looking at things like they were starting with the world of um, Warhol, Rauschenberg, people who were actually working with realism. Um, and so by the time I got in, it was Chuck Close and Philip Perlstein and Janet Fish and people like that. And so they were realists. And I did have a lot of assignments based with abstraction and stuff like that, which I really enjoyed when I was doing it. 
but it's not what I gravitated towards. Right. I, you know, I wanted to s express things that were mired in the world of reality or distorted or absurd reality, but still, you know, recognizable reality. And plus, I had this technical skill where I could actually render that way. And part of it's being an obnoxious show off. Like, you know. <laughs> I do this because I can kind of thing. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. I love it. And and then that's just how you, that's where your creative energy is funneled and that's what happens. Yeah. I mean, it's the vision and it's, the vision is in your head. I didn't really have anything to say in the other realm. And, and I mean, once in a while I did, like, there's this really good, organization called A1 Lab Arts in Knoxville. Yeah. Open to anyone. And years ago, we did the self-portrait show. And it was in the Emporium building. And so basically, as a self-portrait, I found a bunch of... Well, actually, I surreptitiously snuck on somebody's property at night. Public prop... No, it was a business. <laughs> not, not residential. Allegedly. And I cut some limbs off of a willow tree. Yeah. Um, it's so. I'm, it's passed. They can no longer arrest Statute me. Statute of limitations they, are up. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> and so I had these willow branches just sticking up from something, and I hung a bunch of hand painted eyeballs on on wooden on just these little. You buy wooden. You go to Michaels, and you find different size wooden balls mm -hmm. in a bag. And they were hanging off of wires and strings, like everything was just, it was this weird tree thing with eyeballs. I mean, I love it. yeah, but uh, I just, I, I, I haven't had fun to play, time to have fun playing with that stuff. I, I'm just, it's business, business, business. Well, I mean, obviously you're comfortable with all business, but yeah. what, would you be doing the same style of work if you had that free time to goof off and do whatever it was you felt you wanted to do? Yeah. You, for sure, yeah. you would be doing yeah. the same style? Yeah, I mean, you you end up in the direction, not necessarily where you think you're going to go, but you end up in the direction of where you're pushed. And hopefully it's not a sucko direction and the direction the market pushed me in was in a direction I'm really happy to be in. So large format, hyper realistic. Oh pictures. no, I do I do a little thing. I do small paintings. Okay. To, I, and, and that's deliberate because affordability. Yeah. I want um, I do works on paper that I I sell for really inexpensively because I want everyone to well, most budgets to be able to afford to buy original art because yeah. technically art is a luxury item and it, it has. Is. It always has been. Because you don't need um, it. But, yeah. But man, it's nice to have. Yeah. Economically, it goes on the same trajectory as boats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I always, when Sea Ray is doing really well, that means that the arts will do well. As soon as the boat builders start having layoffs, that's when you think, holy shit. So do you keep your ear to the ground on the local boat market? Sea Ray? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sea <laughs> Ray is my guide. And Sea Ray had layoffs in the spring of 2008. And I thought, holy shit, this is it. And then the stock, <laughs> the stock market collapsed in late August. Oh, God. In late August. And my gallery dealer in Asheville at the time, I remember it was January 2008, and she said, my God, something's going to happen. I didn't sell anything this entire month. And it was like, that was the canary, <laughs> these three canaries in the coal mine. So, and then, boom, and then, you know... There was a local group that had started a new gallery space. I'm not going to say the name out loud. I love them too much. And they opened September 2008, and I thought they're going to be dead in a couple. They're going to be dead so quickly. You know, because their rent, they had been using one place where the rent was like $300 a month, and then it went to $2,000 a month. Oh, man. Yeah, that was like suicide, you know, yeah. and... Um, I lost two galleries during the recession, both in Asheville. So how did you discover that parallel the, between the art market and boat market? I always kind of knew it. 
You always kind of knew it. Yeah, Cape Cod, baby. Oh, that's you know? fair. That's fair. Yeah, that makes sense. You, you grew boats. up around a nautical environment and boats and, and, and boats. people that own boats. Yeah, that, yeah. that makes sense. Out in boats. I mean, it's just something that is was innate, you know? Right. You, always around. Yeah, yeah, nobody was... Well, of course, a lot of the people I knew that owned boats, they, they were fishermen, so they had to own a boat. It wasn't a luxury item right. in that case. You know, and... There's nothing like wandering around in your friend's dory with an 18 horsepower Evan Road on it. <laughs> you know, I managed to um, to water ski yeah. off the end of that boat. Hey, it had just enough power where I could levitate on the top of the water without yeah. sinking. <laughs> just enough. Yeah, <laughs> you can do that. Excellent. So that was the cheapest ski you could get, probably right. Like you, that was that was easiest and most efficient way to make that happen. No, it's it was the combination of crap that my friends owned. <laughs> so, yeah. so it was a slap together boat. It was just an old dory, an old lobster dory, an old really. They're heavy, heavy wooden boats. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I was that kid in the sailboat in the movie Jaws. Yeah. I was one, I, not literally, but that was my childhood. <laughs> <you know? laughs> so d does any of that filter into the work you make nowadays, or is it pretty well removed from the imagery you create? The few times I go back up to Massachusetts, it's like I'm going to a foreign country. <laughs> it's culture shock when I go up there. It's... I don't really, you know, it just seems strange to me now. I, well, how long have you been removed from that? I've lived in Knoxville since 1986. You're pretty comfortable here? Oh, God, the first week we moved here, I thought, holy shit, nobody's ever going to make me move away from here. <laughs> These people are nice. They're not mean, you know, and everybody's really nice, and we can actually live in a house instead of an apartment with a prostitute upstairs that has sex in the bathtub. <laughs> and you're sitting, and your kids are, and you're sitting at the table, and the water is coming down the walls, and you can hear, oh, baby, oh, baby, and it's like, shh. Jesus. She works 24 hours a day. That was in Hampton, New Hampshire. That was, not Massachusetts. Things get trashy in New Hampshire, you know? What an experience. Yeah. No, I love this place, and I absolutely, I, I am very much invested by, I mean, I use moon pies. I mean, there's so much cool cultural stuff right. from Tennessee that I integrate into my work. And the coolest thing is, is humor is so important down south, where up north they can just be obnoxious, you know, serious. Yeah. And and where humor is used for cruelty to make fun of other people. I've traveled a bit above the Mason Dixon line. You so know I, that. I've experienced a bit, yeah. You saw that. Where down yeah. here, it's like everyone's mother said, Don't you ever make, you want to make fun of someone? You make fun of yourself. So the humor is self deprecatory. Right. Which yeah. is, and if you can't laugh about that on you, you shouldn't probably be yeah. laughing about it about anybody else either. Yeah, so it's <laughs> it's kind. And I didn't experience a lot of kindness up north. I would growing up I'd be inclined to agree with that. There was a lot of really horrible horrible people. I mean people that um, maybe it's just the stress of living in an environment with a a difficult climate and a difficult financial climate. It's expensive. Yeah. I mean, she's actually Knoxville. What's happening in Knoxville is so depressing. I agree. I mean, uh, <laughs> this, it, there's not enough real estate to go along. There's not enough supply, and the price is going up. It, some of my friends, they're, they can't find a place to live, when, and their rent goes up. I, I know several people who have been priced out of the houses they were renting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it makes me absolutely sick because that's why we came here. We came here to be able to actually find a place we could afford to live in that wasn't the that wasn't where all our neighbors were criminals, you know. Right. No. So we only have one ex con in this neighborhood. Only one? Only one that I hey, know of. That yeah. ratio's low. And he be, he's behaving pretty good. He hasn't committed an act of vandalism in two years. Two years? Two years. Why are you counting? 
<laughs> well, that, that's the morning I woke up and the whole garage was covered with used motor oil. Ah. Because he's, he's mentally ill. And, you know, he's, he's not a bad guy. His parents are really sweet. And he, he has mental and substance abuse problems. And, and then he'll apologize. I'm sorry I did that. I'm sorry I yelled at you when you told me not to set fire to all the leaves in the street. <laughs> <laughs> so that was an act of vandalism two years ago? No, that or was just really a, that was a few months ago. Oh, okay. Well, you know, it's either that or the city sucks them up, right? This is county. Oh, you're out. Okay. Yeah. Then no, they won't. <laughs> we, no, our neighborhood pays for someone. Oh, that's handy. Yeah. So more questions? We're get, I'm getting diverted. <laughs> um what what about so hyperrealism is such an, a a far and removed stylistic achievement from what I do. I'm really okay. curious why you enjoy it so much. Is, it's been what I've been doing my whole life. And, and is it is it the challenge? Is it because you're comfortable in that wheelhouse, or is it just because that's the accurate way you get things out of your mind and through your fingertips? Okay, what's when you look at the entire history of art since the caves? What has the majority of it been? The human form. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's just what there is. And I mean, I grew up literally inside the Worcester Art Museum. And it's one of the two incredible museums, one of the three incredible museums in New England, besides the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum and the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. And I mean, yeah, they had a great contemporary collection, but, you know, I was... I was just taken by the whole realm of European art from medieval to Impressionism and uh, American, early American art, uh, Hudson River School, and even just going back, they had a they had great Asian art there. They had Egyptian art, you know, Mesopotamian. It was just A to Z, you know the whole nine yards in them. Most of it was just, I, I was obsessed with uh, Renaissance art, just really, really obsessed with it when I was a kid. A lot of portraiture? Anything. Anything? Anything, yeah. Yeah, Albrick, Dora, Da Vinci, Raphael. Yeah. And and that's and that's what you found and gravitated to when you were growing up. Yeah, the Flemish the Flemish realist school. Yeah. 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 And then that is a big influence in why you do the work you do now. Or can uh, you draw, can you draw that clear line? Is that something you can say confidently or no? I would say absolutely because especially the the Flemish school when you deal with people like Hieronymus Bosch. Mm -hmm. All the creepy weirdness in there. Yeah. Oh yeah, that, that, I mean, that's all creepy weird. <laughs> they, I love it. They did some. They got into some really weird stuff. Where the Italians were not so weird. They. Well, a lot of the reason why the Italians were so weird is, well. As somebody that, as somebody that grew up exposed to Christianity, it doesn't seem weird. But most of the Italian art, it came out of commissions by the Catholic Church. Right. And from an outsider, Christianity, like any other religion, would be like, what the hell? Yeah. You know, it's just foreign and strange, and that makes no sense. But, but, it, when but you, it operates inside of a very specific context. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but when it's what you're exposed to growing up, you're familiar with that mythology. Right. Or, you know, this mythology or that mythology. And so it makes sense it's a story that's been told and that has united the people or actually not united them have them commit outright mayhem and genocide against each other well that we can yeah we can recognize both aspects of this because it did create yeah. union and worldwide turmoil yeah and, it, <laughs> and, and still does right yeah but anyways it's all those ideas and you know of course when when you're a kid, like, okay, did you ever copy comic book characters? Did I did ever you? draw comic book characters? Uh, yeah, I, I was, I drew things that I saw and I enjoyed seeing. That was definitely, yeah. Yeah. Sure. And I still do that on occasion, but it's, it's for pleasure, not for commerce. 
Yeah, and so you love that world, and so you want to replicate it and yeah. see, can I do my it myself? It, with me, it was Mad Magazine. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My parents didn't know I was spent, you know, whenever my dad would give me a job and I'd get a few bucks, I'd sneak down until into the... We had a pharmacy in our town. We had about five or six businesses in the town, and I'd sneak down and I'd buy a copy of Mad Magazine when they didn't know it. Was that was that too risque for you to be enjoying? No, it's... Oh, no, 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 no. It was lowbrow. Oh, okay. Oh, no. I My parents didn't censor anything. Excellent. Anything. But my mother was the world's greatest cultural snob. So no fart jokes. That was the worst. No, actually... Actually, dirty jokes are required. <laughs> They're mandato- okay, ma- okay. mandatory. Crude humor is mandatory. It's a very strange world. I can- My father was the king of lowbrow, supposedly, and my mother was the ultra-cultural ultra snob. And so the conflict that went on in the house the was The banter must fun. have been golden. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it was fun. Um, anything my mother detested... My brother and I latched onto oh, immediately, like right? crazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyone she hated on the Ed Sullivan show, that we were the biggest fans immediately, <laughs> and we would imitate whatever. You really, really hitting mom where it hurts. Well, it was just, it was just funny, and right. my my father <laughs> would. We, I, I grew up with season tickets to the opera and symphony, and so then my father would be watching opera performers on the Ed Sullivan show and he would be translating the Italian when my mother was out of the room you know making up vulgar lyrics <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent yeah so I don't know there weren't any rules well that's great I, I, yeah, what, a, what a wonderful way to have an environment to grow up in being a creative person my mother's name was Savage maiden name? yeah uh, and her nickname was Savage Beast. So that's kind of how I grew up. So you had a very <laughs> serious mix of personalities in the house. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, Wonderful. and then all the cultural snobs, all my grandmother's sisters and brothers. It was kind of hilarious at at time. So, and I knew that they all grew up on a chicken farm in Rutland in the next <laughs> town. And it's like... What are you giving me airs? You grew up feeding chickens your whole childhood. Right. <laughs> you know, I know where you come from. <laughs> so I'll, I want to ask you about some tools. I see that you have like a, a magnifying set of headwear over there. Yeah. Do, do you have uh, a specific set of tools that you like to use to create this work? I don't. I, I, I don't wear those anymore. I keep forgetting. <laughs> You know, if I want to see up close, I just take my glasses off. But um, I gravitate towards just certain types of brushes that are either sharply angled or really pointy or Mm -hmm. really long. Like to do a lot of really fine lines, you use these brushes called rigger brushes. And they used to be, they were designed to paint rigging and sailboat and boat paintings back in the like, 17th, 18th, 19th century, and you load them up, they're long and skinny, you mm-hmm. load them up with a lot of paint and you can drag a line forever, you know? In my experience, those are uh, script brushes, but in automotive pinstriping, really long, skinny brushes. Those are larger, those are a little bit bigger. Yeah, uh, diamond yeah, wise of the brush itself, yes, yeah, but yeah. very skinny. They're similar, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've seen sign painters do stuff with that, and holy cow, yeah. that's amazing with that, that's you know, a big, freehand sign painting. That's a big inspiration of mine. Like that sign making and uh, pinstriping and automotive art from the late 40s to the early 70s. Oh, yeah. From like the straight up stripped down hot rodder stuff that you would yeah. see on the Saturday nights all the way to the psychedelic painted gold flake low rider everything. Like oh, all yeah. of that is really big in my wheelhouse. The Chicano stuff is the best. Oh man, the paint jobs yeah. are crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I very much enjoy that arena of automotive expression those cars are no joke yeah. they're, they're really done well and from start to finish are done well did you know that cheech marin is a massive art collector i did yeah. yes i have his ca- catalog of his 
work he owns that he actually had Target, believe it or not, sponsor to exhibit around the country. <laughs> yeah. Target. Yeah, and you can see, I mean, figurative art's huge with Chicano art. And a lot of them, of course, love to paint mm -hmm. imagery of people standing around with lowrider cars yeah. with really cool paint jobs on them. That, those, uh, those types of aesthetics are really influencing an automotive themed body of work I have right now. Uh -huh. I'm really happy to be working yeah. on it too. It's, it's yeah. so much fun. Yeah. All the colors, the stripes, the different materials, the flakes, the sparkles, the, the doilies and lace patterns. It's great. Sparkle? Yeah, the metallic like sparkle. Metallic? Yeah. Oh, metallic paint, not glitter, you know. Correct, correct. I've used glitter. I, I've I, would, embedded, I would see that it fits. I've embedded actual glitter. You, you use some resin, mm -hmm. and then you... you I, didn't, I don't like to overdo it, so then you try to touch the brush into some glitter, and you're just going to touch it into the areas and where it, you want it, it to falls stick. falls into the resin. Yeah, yeah, and you carefully add the amount you want. Yeah, I've used um, Mardi Gras cakes. I've used, <laughs> I've used them as models, so then I figure, look at all that sparkly sugar. I'm just going to use glitter. Right. I will add glitter to it, and then you walk back and forth yeah. in front of the painting, and, and it will spark. Yeah. The light you will see hit where it, it and it will spark. Yeah. Um, I've used uh, some, some of the crazier materials that I've had in my art the last two years or so. I've been... Um, powdered pigments of the UV variety so I'll make uh, oh wow I'll make jewelry that have a lot of relief or negative space in them and then I'll fill that with some sort of resin um, that have the the colored pigments or the UV pigments or a glow-in-the-dark powder or something in them and that's been really entertaining for me and and my pursuits uh, you see, you get to see the depth of the cavity that you fill if you mix it right and pour everything at the right time so the viscosity doesn't let everything just sink to the bottom. Can you see it without a black light though? Uh, yeah, oh, it, okay. it's 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 a it's a solid colored powder. It's not any sort of okay. translucent. Um, it it is it is the color in normal light the the color it glows, so you get oh, a one to one. Okay. So I grew up in. The era of the black light and the psychedelic poster. You have I have, have several of those light. in my home. Yeah. Okay, good. Keep, keep the tradition going. <laughs> I, I sell a lot of. Well, I don't think you're familiar with my body work, so I. I've I, seen some. I, 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 make, I make a lot of things that glow yeah. or shine or interact with the light or absence thereof in some way. Yeah. And that really entertains me. I don't like people turning the lights off in their house and their art disappears. Your work is on your mask. You're correct. Thank you for yes. noticing. Uh, so, you know, I like to make things that play with light or the absence of. And glowing things is, you know, when people turn their light switch off, they have a different piece to look at. Yeah. So I, I really enjoy that, whether it's practical or, you know, whatever. It, it, it entertains me, and that's the experience I want people to have. And when I tell people, hey, for, like, premium viewing in your home you should have some sort of black light do you have one and most people say no, <laughs> no. I'm like, what are you doing with your life you know <laughs> and i i understand that that response to that question is a little out of out of sorts because most people don't have black lights in their home and that's the normal now but i yeah. am going to rebel with everything in me to let that not be normal so yeah. if i can give a person an excuse to go buy one i'm gonna do it yeah I yeah. very much enjoy making those style pieces. And wearable stuff, too, is also a mm -hmm. ton of fun. I know people have gotten into, it's mostly acrylic paints that mm -hmm. are called, I think it's interferon. Uh, yeah, interference paints? Interference paints, yeah. And what it is is it's almost like pearlescent mm -hmm. type of things where the color has a sheen that fluctuates. Yes. Depending uh, upon the angle. I've used some of those. I like yeah. them a lot. Uh, yeah. I've used them on, I think, two of my geometric pinstripey pieces. It's a white and a violet, and I like it a lot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, see, I'll use metallic paints. I use oil, and they don't really come in oil, but oil has all these really cool metallic paints, and I like the gold. And you mix it in with other stuff, and you don't realize it's metallic anymore, and but it still this... it gives this gleam. Mm -hmm. I feel like the... The way the light plays with a lot of metallic pigments, especially if they're in some sort of clear or translucent 
body. It, yeah. You get the depth because you see light go into it, mm -hmm. and you see light shine out of it. Yeah. And I love that. Yeah. The, the depth. You're, it's not a lot, but you see it, and you recognize it's there, and that's really neat. Yeah. So what, when, when do you use a lot of those um, other materials like glitter and such, just whenever it needs it? Or whenever it needs it, yeah. Like um, I've done pieces where the whole background is kind of like a, a goldish ochre color, but I want to amp it up, so I just throw a lot of metallic in the mix, and yeah. it just gives a slight luminosity off to it that that's it's 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 subtle mm -hmm. it's not screaming i mean to really get a gold you have to use this has been sitting here um this is the real the stinky stuff the, the stuff that stuff. stinks so bad you have to work outside and even outside you still have to wear a spray mask or something well this this looks yeah. very gold i bought i broke the bunny i broke its ears off I had it packed wrong. Oh no, it fell on the floor. It was up on my router table and it fell on the floor. And so I did the Japanese technique. Oh, and you of, put the gold in the cracks? Yeah, and I can never remember the name, but when they repair things in Japan, they repair the broken sections with gold. Yeah. With gold lines. So the bunny is packed somewhere back in there. And it has gold I, in its cracks. Yeah, I've had this out because after I super glued it, I spray, I put lines of gold on top of the super glue. I like that, and that was totally on accident. And then, yeah, and then you had the I'm, opportunity to make it really neat. Yeah, I have to be careful. I've I break I've broken a lot of my stuff. And and you have those for reference, more or less. Yeah, they're, they're my props, my models, and my props and stuff. And I, you know, that's I've been doing a lot of photo shoots, so I I haven't put them away. This is usually not here. But and you but, do you, you generate a lot of your own reference material, right? Do you have to for what you want to do? I collect it. Okay. I go hunting it down. Um, I have the horrible temptation of wanting a three D printer. Uh, well, let me tell you about that real quick. Okay. Um, yes, but no. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I spend a lot of my time working with that robot that I have in my house, and um, I try very hard not to just make useless shit for no reason. And it's really easy to do that. So I know. That's, that's my only warning. I collect useless shit for a good reason. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I, what I mean when I say that is I try not to print uh, tchotchkes and, and whatever it is that I would use once and then sit on a shelf forever. I try to make tools and, and uh, stencils and, and practical things that support uh, my other artistic endeavors. But on the flip side of that, I do use it to create wholly um, intended items for that workflow and that workflow only. So I, uh, I do a lot of my jewelry on the printer and then do the resins and stones post-process to that machine. But uh, I've also made stencils and stamps and um, um, like uh, stamps, essentially, with, yeah. with the machine. And it's, I, try to, I try to use it in that scope. It keeps me uh, reined in on what I need it for. Yeah, I mean, I, I, taught, I taught as a contract instructor in the theater department for five years at UT, teaching um, costume illustration to the grad students. Mm -hmm. And it's this shitty old house that the grad students have. Um, and inside the sh <laughs> shitty old one of the worst departments for having horrible environment, in, you know, UT needs a theater, you know, a decent theater department housing, but they had a 3D printer and a laser um, cutter. And being, a, if I was like adjunct, I would, I'd use the tool. Oh, yeah. But as a contract instructor that only came in two hours a week. You couldn't really. It's, it's like a different, I had the free pack parking pass. Yeah. But I didn't really have feel like I ever had access to touch anything, you know? And that's a serious bit of toys not to be able to play with. I love it. Oh, <laughs> man. I used to look at the thing and think, what would I, you know, and then uh -huh. a student would be using them. Or then, the, this is the thing I love the most, when the theater, when the lighting and design students would leave their little 3D dioramas where instead of just buying, you know, 
these little plastic figures to stand in as stage performers. They were starting to produce them on the yeah. 3D printer, and they I see that you know with the with the uh, the whole thing set out with black backgrounds and white figures and everything, and I'd say, boy, would I like to play with that toy. <laughs> and I saw one for sale in Home Depot for a thousand dollars, and then I thought that's probably it would be a. That, that, did that turn you off? No, I thought that must be a really shitty one. <laughs> and I like expensive. That was, that was probably a Dremel. And yeah. They're not in production anymore, just so you know. It wasn't. I think it might have been a Dremel, but what are cheap tool are cheap are cheap tools worth it? Um. So my no. my printer okay. was like uh, two hundred seventy five bucks. Uh, it's a you're kidding. No. You can get one that oh, cheap? You can get some for cheaper, but the the floor is not much lower than that for quality machines. You can get yeah. cheaper ones in the $100 range, but you don't really want that. Um, Two to $300 will get you a really, really good, fairly darn accurate desktop machine. I have an Ender 3 Pro. I actually have two of them, to be completely honest, and uh, I love them. They're, they're good machines. They have their limitations, but what they do, they do really well. Okay, I've only heard conversations of, amongst people who use them that are like buy them in the five to ten thousand dollar range. If you're doing industrial applications with powdered bed uh, they were. materials, amazing machines. But if yeah. if you're just wanting to do some stuff at the house, uh, just just to have something at home, then one of these desktop machines is where it's at. I, okay. Trust me, I could totally utilize a ten thousand dollar fused powder bed machine yeah. and do lots of stuff. But what else comes with that? Like all the all the bags of material and air filters and pumps and all the other Ooh. hardware you need to make that work. Oh. It's a very industrial setup. Okay. Uh, but the, those machines are insanely capable and I, can do full color life size prints. It's amazing. I can't justify the cost. I'll, I wish I could justify the cost. <laughs> <laughs> I, I the only thing I'm spending ten k on is a house down payment or another vehicle. So. Uh, a three hundred dollar printer does me just fine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but with me with power tools, I don't buy cheap. Power. And, and and one should. You can get injured by cheap power. Yeah. You know. Uh, the, the price is definitely a factor. Yeah. But this this line of products has got it pretty well nailed down. Yeah. I, I like them. Sorry if that sways you one way or the other, but it is just the truth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I think part of finding cool tchotchkes and stuff is the hunt. If you choose to hunt for cool stuff to print on the internet, you can find no bottom to this rabbit hole. Oh, shoot. Now you're talking about hunting for I know. I'm sorry. I am oh. so sorry. Please don't do this to yourself. I've lost <laughs> countless hours of my life looking for cool shit to print on the internet. Don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> There's so many websites. There's so much information available. Don't do it to yourself. Oh, boy. But, yeah, it's, it's a thing. Um, sorry to inform you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um... I don't know. I there there's people out there. Well, part of the thing of what I do is I'm getting these objects that are created by other artists. So when you're looking at my work, you're looking at layers and centuries of visual designers and commercial artists and stuff that have been producing things in porcelain and ceramic and fabric and even food design, you yeah. know. And so it's it's kind of like a celebration of what they do too and if i'm making my own then it, you know it there's less cultural reference it's just totally just me doing myself so it's it doesn't have any historic it it it's just it doesn't have the broad expanse and is that a positive or a negative in this context? I want the broad expanse. You want context? Yeah, I want to see, you know, what type of weird, bizarre stuff did they produce uh, in France? Well, don't don't let me tell you that there are lots centuries and lots ago and lots of historical objects that have been full color three D scanned for reproduction. That's a thing. A lot yeah. of public historical entities have these files available to people yeah. for free. Don't go look those up. It's another bottomless rabbit hole. Don't. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know that you can actually buy Hieronymus Bausch action figures from his um, his 
infamous triptych, The Garden of Earthly Delights? Action figures. I did not know. Yes, and I have one here. <laughs> please, please if, if it is easy, I want to see. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and not, I mean, if you're familiar with Hieronymus uh, Bosch's work. This would make my friend Ethan so happy. Yes. Ethan, I hope you're listening. Okay. Oh, here it is. Aha. Okay. <laughs> not, and if you're familiar with his work, you know that Hieronymus Bosch likes to stick things in people's butts. He does. Yeah, and so I've got this one. Realize <laughs> it? I have had flowers in his butts, <laughs> radishes, and parts of um, snack cakes in different paintings. <laughs> in I this love guy's it. Butt. And it's the character that there's a head of a human attached to what looks like it could be an animal yeah, it, it, with legs, but it's, feet. it's got like an egg body, and then on top of his head he's got a flat hat that looks like it's got a dismembered heart. Well, well, you know, it's, it's Bosch. Yeah, it, it could be several things. Yeah. <laughs> if any, if I didn't I have, know you could buy those figures. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, they're, they've got a bunch of them out there, but out of <laughs> all the people in art history who you would like to talk to would not Hieronymus Bosch be one of the top oh I would love yeah like, that'd be what great. the hell was so you know? <laughs> uh, also um, uh, Caravaggio I would love to talk to Caravaggio because he used a lot of his reference for his biblical figures uh, just people off the street and the church hated that and they would still pay him god awful amounts of money to do it oh come on the church knew that if you had a blonde woman in a portrait it was a prostitute yeah but they, they would yeah. probably be okay with that I mean yeah. he, his his paintings of Virgin Mary were of his muse prostitute uh, partner for the majority of his life all and, models were models off the street god in college we had to fire one guy because he was he he ended up being a pervert. Oh I'm no! Not, yeah, he had something he wanted to do in class that was illegal. Well, it was a victimless crime unless you were sitting too close to him. Oh but yeah. Anyways, <laughs> he was fired. I had one poor woman that came in one day. She was black and blue from head to toe. Somebody beat her up, and I mean, you don't. And sometimes the models were other students. True. But heck, we were from the street too. Kind right, of whatever. Way, you know, we were... <laughs> so, somebody's got to do it. I mean, who do they think you were going to use as a model? Right. It's not like there's a whole subsect of society that was just yeah. like, no, we're models for religious paintings and religious paintings only. It's now, just yeah, whoever. Now with Caravaggio, it would have been somebody that he dragged back from the bar. Right, the bar and might have gotten into a fight with at the bar. You know, yeah. It, <laughs> yeah. Perhaps it's not out of the question. Yeah. Uh, that his, his more or less outlaw attitude always always entertained me. So I would love to have a, a glass of wine with him. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. I don't drink, so I'm going to stick with Bosch. That's fair. Maybe he did. Uh, they were all. They, you couldn't really drink the water back then. No. No. <laughs> so a lot of people. No, drank really wine. well. Yeah. So there was a lot of actually, there was a lot of beer. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, yeah, there, there's that's not a short list of artists I would like to pick their brain, but that one's pretty darn close to the top. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. You have an, you have another one besides Bosch that you would love to have a chat with. Um, I always everyone always thinks Da Vinci, but I bet he would be in a real pain in the ass know it all to talk to. You're probably right. I'm, yeah. I'm not going to fight that assumption whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, he had a post in society that not not a lot of people get to 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 occupy. So. Yeah, he was arrogant. He made fun of Michelangelo's drawings. And stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know, it was no. Nah. Oh, the other one would be Elizabeth Vigi Lebrun, I and no she idea who that is. she was the considered the greatest artist in France during the reign of Marie Antoinette. Okay. And she became the official court painter of Marie Antoinette. And she was also like the highest paid artist. And then, of course, she was written out of history and out of the history books because she was a woman. But she's been written back into them now. Right. Justice has come around. I mean, her, her works yeah. are still around, correct, I'd assume? Versailles is full of them. Okay. Yeah. 
So um, I would just, her mom was a hairdresser and her, which was a lot of work back then, you know, those wigs. Mm. And her dad was a miniature painter and she grew up learning from him and he died when she was uh, adolescent and she took over his business at that age. At, at 11? Uh, at, at around 11, she was an adolescent. I f that, forgot, you know, exactly. Yeah. That's pretty wild from today's standards. That would never fly today. Yeah, yeah. And so she had to run to England when heads began to roll. Yeah, I would imagine. <laughs> yeah. But she was a lot older then, and she, she took off with her daughter to England, who was, I think her daughter was probably an adult by then. But, but man, I mean, she had like the biggest, one of the biggest business opportunities in the country. Boom, she got it. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Goodness. That's... That is a very foreign idea, like operating a full-blown, like royal adjacent business as as a, a tween and a teen and a young adult. Well, by the time she got the job, she was in her twenties, I think. Yeah, that, you know. I would imagine that transition wasn't just instant. Oh no, no, she had taken over her father's customers. You know, the type. I I had. I think they had the type of thing where both shops were in the same place. So you came in to get your hair done. And then it looks so good, you know, you had to have like a little portrait painted. <laughs> right, or, right. You know, yeah, yeah cause because otherwise, all that work for nothing and, yeah. and, it, and it's not Two preserved weeks, it for history. Look the same. Right. You know, you have to preserve that hairdo for history. They didn't have Instamatic cameras back then. That's true, they did yeah. not. <laughs> yeah. That had to be a unique environment all by itself. Go get your hair cut and sit still for a portrait. I'm assuming it was, I mean, that's the way businesses were built back right. then. And they probably slept upstairs. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah. Second and third story, or second story. Yeah, and it was in, pretty sure it was in Paris. Yeah, they were Parisian. So. <laughs> I'm sure that would be a wild conversation all by itself. Yeah. Well, Denise, is there, uh, is there anything else sticking out in your brain that you want people to know about who you are and how you do your work? Uh, not particularly. I mean, it's just... We're, we're in a particular point of time now in which there is so much out there, all of these different genres, and all of them have equal legitimacy and equal interest from conceptual to post-studio to, oh, the only thing, de-skilled de art, no. No. <laughs> I want that to die so bad. Is, is this know. a genre of... Uh, of what this is this term is de skilling de skilling look it up it makes me just want to kick somebody does it in sound it. like what i think it sounds like it sounds like you couldn't get a good you flunked algebra class you couldn't get anywhere for any you know you had to get into college because the art department is the only one of the only ways to get in without sat scores mm -hmm. and so you didn't have the skill for that either. <laughs> so you decided, hey, let's make this the next trendy thing. No, screw that. Okay. I, I am... Are you very anti-bananas taped to walls? I actually like Maurizio Catalan. <laughs> I like him. Did you ever see he also did the thing of the Pope with the meteor? I did. I did. Yes, yes. I, I like Maurizio. I... That stuff's funny. I like that. It is. It is funny. I do that's agree. not de-skilled, though. That's conceptual. That's good. That's okay. But skill. Skill's your car. You you know you get in that you can drive anywhere. Yeah. You know. And to to glorify the lack of is is atrocious. It's, it's absolutely atrocious <laughs> because there's not many places you can go without skill. Fair. You can't even make fun of a de-skilled piece by imitating it unless you have the skill set, <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, the irony of that is intense. Yeah, I agree. You have to uh, you have to have skills enough to replicate that to be satirical about it. Yeah, and I mean... That, if you, if, and that, that's self-defeating right there. Any other pursuit in life, you know, like medical, you don't want a de-skilled doctor, mm -hmm. do you? No, you no. want one with a skill set, you know? <laughs> Well, I'm glad we've uncovered that. Uh, do you want to plug your socials one more time so people can hear it, and then I'll talk us out. Okay. Um, 
my website is stuart-sanabria.com S-T-E-W S-A-N Hold it. No, I said that wrong. That was my email address. I don't know. <laughs> okay, no. Well, if you want me to just uh, put that in the episode notes, I can certainly He's going to put it on the notes. You'll actually see it. <laughs> yes, I'll put it in a hyperlink. You can click it. It'll open a new window, and, and then you'll be there. No, you just Google my full... Nobody else in the world has those three names. Denise, Stewart, Sanabria. And it's like Sangria, but it's Sanabria. And you lucked out having the most Google-friendly name. Google unique. Fair. So you Google it, you find my website, you find everything else. You know. It's there. It's easy to find. One Google yeah. away. Yeah. I don't think there's anything there that makes me cringe. Like, oh shit, that thing is still showing up. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so go ahead and Google your name? Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, everybody. Google her name. You can find her works on her websites and her social medias. Uh, this is Thomas Zachary. This has been another episode of the KAAMP. If you want to find the artist's work and perhaps buy some, you can do that on the website or through the five galleries she is currently trying to keep supplied. I'm sure there's a list, a list of those on her website as well. Um, if you want to support the show, you can uh, share the show. You can force feed your friends the show when they're in the car. You can tell them to shove it in their damn ear holes. That's where it needs to be. <laughs> Um, if you want to support the person that makes the show, you can buy my art uh, from my website or from me directly because I have no associated galleries. <laughs> I'm just running around grassroots as it gets. But uh, that is The Twisted Wrist with periods between the twisted and wrist on Instagram. Um, big red-headed dude. You'll be able to find me in the picture. It's really easy. Um, I make crazy psychedelic art for your eyes and the lack of light. Thank you very much. This has been the KAAMP.